Well, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm here to tell you about our work on using formal methods for analyzing network performance. So over the past decade or so, there's been this shift toward um, kind of using automated formal analysis tools uh, to kind of reason about network behavior. And if you want to look at this approach at maybe 10,000 feet, um, usually how it works is, is that you create a mathematical model of your network, usually using logical formulas. And then you specify the properties that you're interested in against the same model, so basically um, you know, using a similar notation. And then you feed both of them into a formal analysis tool. So this could be a model checker, a symbolic executor, or kind of some combination of that. And that tool is going to automatically analyze the entire input space for you. So in this case, you could think of it as all the kind of different packets that could enter your network. And then it will either tell you that, you know, kind of no matter what the input is going to look like, the property is always going to hold, or give you an encounter example, kind of a concrete input example for which the property is not going to hold. So now, if you look at all the different kind of properties that uh, people have been looking at uh, over the past uh, few years, most of it is kind of focusing on functional correctness properties. So this would be, for example, something like, is A reachable from B, or you know, is my tennis configuration working properly? Is, kind of iso is my traffic being isolated properly or not? And in this work, uh, what we're focusing on is uh, basically, what about performance? So what if um, you know, I want to ask questions about a flow throughput, or would packets in a certain traffic class uh, kind of experience latency beyond a certain uh, kind of amount? Or, uh, st um, uh, starvation or uh, kind of fairness, you know, if a certain flow is going to get a much larger share of the bandwidth that it's supposed to. So as I said, uh, the focus of this work is try to see um, if you can use formal methods to reason about performance properties. And uh, for the next few minutes in, in the talk, I'm going to tell you about the implications of that. So if you want to transition from thinking about correctness properties into performance properties. So the first one uh, is the model. So, and I'm going to use a very simple example uh, just for the discussion here. So let's say we have a switch. And if we were only interested in uh, kind of its functionality, um, you know, we could just kind of look at how it decides how to forward a packet into a port. And uh, this is a problem that has been very extensively studied. But now if you want to think about performance, uh, of course the port that the packet is going to enter out of is going to matter, but it is also going to matter how long the packet is going to spend in the switch. And for that, we're going to have to model the queues because it could be that the, the packet has to wait in the queue for a little while before it can be sent out. And in general, it means that packet interactions are going to matter. So we can't really look at an individual packet anymore as our input. But now we have to kind of model or reason about packet sequences that could come in from different ports and compete with each other for uh, kind of the resources on the switch. And on top of that, if you want to think about anything related to rates, so if there's a rate limiter or um, you know, if you're thinking about throughput properties, then the time that these packets are going to arrive at the switch are also going to matter. So our input space is going to go from an individual packet to timed packet sequences. So given all that, um, how are we kind of modeling things in our work? Well, the building block in our modeling is uh, what we call a queuing module, which has a very general um, kind of description. Basically, there are a number of input queues and a number of output queues, and then a processing block in the middle that takes packets from the inputs, uh, processes them, and pushes them into the output. And as you might have guessed, you know, these modules are kind of very easy to combine with each other because you, because you can kind of just feed out the output uh, queues of one module into the input queues of the, ne uh, of the next one and have them interact with each other. And what I want to do emphasize here is that we're modeling our queues very explicitly. So um, you know, we have individual variables representing if there is a packet at every index, at every queue at any point in time, uh, and if there's a packet, the information about that packet. So with that kind of explicit modeling and all these components interacting with each other, uh, we ended up with a lot of variables and constraints. Um, so we had to do some optimizations to make sure this is tractable to analyze. And some of them that I'm just going to briefly touch on are, the first one is about abstracting time. So we're not using wall clock time. Um, we have an abstract time that progresses when a DQ happens. We're doing bounded time analysis. So we're looking at uh, the behavior of these queuing modules over a bounded number of DQs. And we did a lot of work on trying to actually efficiently encode um, kind of the behavior of the queues and also how the modules are composed with each other because these two are kind of the uh, most integral part of our modeling. 
All right, so the model is then a composition of um, the queuing modules. So now onto the properties. So how would you specify the properties that you're interested in, the performance properties that you're interested in? Um, well, first you have to define the performance metrics that you're interested in. And in our model, uh, we define our metrics over queues. So that could be the size of a queue, the number of total packets that have entered the queue so far, uh, the inter-arrival gap between the packets that kind of came into the queue, and you know, any other metric that you're interested in. So there are a bunch of them that are predefined, but you know, it can be user-defined as well. And then once you have the metrics, now the property is going to compare the metrics with some certain values so that they take a kind of a form of a comparison. So if you think about kind of the example that we just had about these three different modules composed with each other, so um, the pro a property could compare uh, the value of a metric for a single queue to a certain threshold. It could compare the value of a metric uh, between two different queues. And it can also compare the sum of a, a value of a metric over a set of queues to a certain threshold. Okay, so now we have defined our model. We know how to define our properties. So in the next step, uh, we want to analyze them together to see you know, if it's um, um, going to be uh, holding or not. So here, um, specifically, we want to analyze um, basically uh, the conjunction of the model and the negation of the property, because if that is satisfiable, it means that the property is not going to hold in some cases. And in our case, uh, this logical formula is an SMT formula with certain properties. It's quantify-free. It um, is a mix of booleans and kind of integer arithmetic. And we just feed it to Z3 to kind of analyze it for us and let us know if this is satisfiable or not. Okay, the next step uh, is when, you know, we're gonna know if the property is holding or uh, not. And especially when the property doesn't hold, right, uh, our model checker, which is, so we're doing battle model checking with Z3, right? So our model checker is supposed to give us an input example for which the property is not gonna hold. So let's look at how um, kind of that output example is going to look like. And here I'm also going to use a very simple example. So let's say we are uh, basically trying to analyze a strict priority scheduler. Um, so F1 prioritize over F2 and kind of all the way down. And the property we are interested in is related to starvation. So uh, we don't want F3 to be blocked for transmission or get starved for X consecutive time steps. So we model the scheduler, we model the property with all that I just talked about, and we feed that into Z3, and Z3 says, hey, this doesn't hold. And at this point, it is supposed to give us a particular input for which this is not gonna, and not gonna hold, right? So how are we modeling the inputs in our model with timed packet sequences? So as you might remember from earlier in the talk, timed packet sequences are going to have a lot of detail about uh, the time and order at which packets entered, um, enter the queue. And this is something that was intentional, right? We needed all those details in our model to kind of look at the entire space, but this is not something that is necessarily useful in the output. So why is that? Well, first of all, not all of these details are gonna matter with respect to our property. So in this case, right, does it really matter that F1 got exactly three packets in the first time step or F4 didn't really get any packets in time steps uh, two and three. Well, really not. You know, it just matters about kind of higher priority queues getting more traffic. And the second reason is that it's really unclear if this single trace is going to point to an important problem, right? So if you're thinking about functional correctness, even if there's a single trace for which the network is not really behaving correctly, then uh, that's, that's a bug you actually want to go and check out. But when it comes to performance, we're making trade-offs all the time. So if there's a one in a billion trace where the performance is gonna drop a little bit, um, you know, it really might not matter. Okay, so so far we know that we don't wanna output uh, just a single kind of packet trace um, as an example. So the alternative that we're proposing is to instead generate a set of conditions on the input that are going to lead to a problem, a performance problem in the network. So what would that look like for this particular example? So here, you know, we would, it would be ideal to kind of output if F1 or F2, which are the higher priority queues, um, have packets for X consecutive time steps, then you know, F3 is gonna be start. And this is not a single packet trace. This is a set of conditions that is describing many packet traces, and each one of them, if you feed it into the scheduler, is going to cause that problem. And this is what we're calling a workload. So a conjunction of constraints on the input that are going to lead to a performance problem. And 
And uh, we do have a formal way to define it. We have a grammar to kind of uh, constrain the space uh, of what kind of workloads we're going to look at. And again, what I want to emphasize is that this is, this is going to concisely represent a set of traces. So it is going to be more informative because it is trying to capture the common attributes between all those traces that violated the, uh, the property. And because it's not one trace and a set of traces, there's a higher chance that it's actually pointing to an important problem. OK, so back to this picture. Um, so we were at the step where we wanted to generate some example for the time that the property doesn't hold. And now we say we don't want to generate an example. We actually want to generate a workload. So um, how do we do that? Uh, we use syntax-guided synthesis. So very quickly, um, how it is, it, it, this works is that we have a search algorithm that is searching the space of the entire uh, kind of all the workloads that, are, uh, that we can describe in our grammar. It will pick a candidate workload that it thinks might be the answer. And it will ask the model checker to check if all the traces in that workload are going to violate the property. If yes, that is going to be our answer, and we're going to return that to the user. And if not, the model checker is going to return some feedback to the search algorithm so that it can kind of pick the, more, uh, pick the next candidate uh, more carefully. And putting all of that together, we have ourselves a formal performance analyzer. We have developed a prototype of this, and we are calling it fperf. So um, I didn't get to talk about a lot of details about uh, kind of each, uh, each box, but in the paper, there's a lot of information about the details of our search algorithm um, and how it works, all the optimizations that we did, both for the search part and for the uh, verification and model checking part, and again, all the different things that we did to make this work. Right, so finally, I want to tell you about some of the case studies we did to evaluate our uh, approach. So uh, the first set of case studies were around packet scheduling algorithms. Um, so we did model a, uh, kind of a number of standalone packet schedulers, meaning that each one of them was just an uh, a one queuing module. And we asked questions about starvation and fairness properties. And we also composed them together. And uh, this is what the composition looks like. It has about 11 queuing modules. It is trying to model a combination of host and NIC scheduling. And it is inspired from uh, kind of the Loom paper from NSTI 2011, and, uh, 2019. And we also asked questions about starvation and fairness. And a couple of highlights here. Uh, well, the model sizes were about um, kind of around tens of thousands of variables and constraints, so fairly large. Um, the search algorithm uh, finishes in a reasonable amount of uh, time, so a few hundreds of rounds, a couple of hundreds of seconds. And something I didn't, got to, I didn't get to talk about but wanted to mention here is that there is an example generation phase before the search starts. It creates some example traces that actually uh, guide the search, and that um, that ended up being a bottleneck, uh, which, and we talked in the paper about kind of ways that we can improve that. Uh, then when it comes to kind of verifying the workloads, this is when we kind of ask the uh, bound model checker to analyze the model and the workload together, uh, that is actually quite efficient. So in, on average, it finished kind of le on less than a second. So uh, this is where we realize our optimizations uh, paid off. And overall, um, you know, in all these cases, we were able to synthesize workloads uh, in a couple of minutes. We did do another case study on uh, a small leaf spine network. So um, one things that I wanted to highlight here was that this was around kind of twice the size of the composition example that I just talked about. And the properties we asked about here were about throughput and latency, and we observed similar trends in terms of the search time, verification uh, time, and just the total time. We also used this case study to kind of look at how the tool is going to scale. So we increased the size of the network and looked at the runtime um, of the tool. And something that was not surprising is that uh, the trend is exponential. That is um, kind of quite expected from uh, tools like this. Um, so but one thing that uh, kind of is very convinced of a lot here is that going forward, modular analysis is going to be very crucial for uh, scaling this approach. So to conclude, um, I wanted to uh, kind of mention again that our goal here was to explore the transition from reasoning about functional correctness properties into performance properties. And we, what we found is that there are actually very interesting implications on the kind of modeling and um, you know, analysis techniques that we should use, one of them being that synthesizing workloads seem to be uh, kind of a more um, useful uh, kind of output as opposed to just outputting individual counterexamples. And we're very excited about the possibilities that lie ahead. Uh, the code is um, online on GitHub. And we're actively looking for use cases or ideas to improve the tools. So if you're, if you're interested, uh, please do reach out. 
And with that, I'm uh, happy to take questions.